it's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope. Larry Lasser from the CBS television news staff and Thomas J. Hamilton, chief of the New York Times United Nations Bureau. Our distinguished guest for this evening is Sayed Amjad Ali, ambassador from Pakistan to the United States. Mr. Ambassador, yesterday, after a lot of preliminary rumors, President Eisenhower officially announced that we were going to grant military aid to your country. Now, may I ask you why your country has requested this military aid? If uh, you are familiar with the geography of my country, you'd know that, first of all, we are divided in two parts. In the west, uh, we border Afghanistan, Iran, and China. There's um, a narrow tongue of about 60 miles which uh, separates uh, Pakistan territory from the Soviet Union. But if you go to Chitral, which is um, about 16,000 feet, you can see the lights of uh, Mer, which is in the Soviet Union from Chitral. And on the east um, side, we border Burma, and again, not very far from um, China, Communist China. And of course, in between, we have uh, India. I know your country is very big. It's one of the largest in the world. I believe it's uh, about the size of Texas and New York State put together. And I guess you have about 80 million people there. But I'd like to ask, how much money do you expect to get from the United States? And uh, what will we get out of it? Will we get air bases in Pakistan? Well, sir, as um, far as uh, the money is concerned, uh, we have uh, no idea. And uh, what we are requiring from the United States is equipment. A military mission will go out to Karachi, and they'll go around our military stations, and they will assess what we require uh, to equip the deficiencies in our, our armed forces, that is the Army, the Air Force, and the Navy. So in terms of money, I couldn't give you an idea because after the assessment has been made, then again, the assessment would be more or less in arms and not in money. As far as basis is concerned, uh, there has absolutely been no talk at any time about basis. What about your relations with India, Mr. Ambassador? I believe that the Prime Minister, Mr. Nehru, has already protested against this when it was first mentioned. Well, he, he has been protesting uh, for the last three months, uh, as you know, uh, and in this country, uh, I've been reading the last three months protests uh, from Prime Minister Nehru and um, from the newspapers of India. Our relationships have um, been sometimes good and sometimes not so good. Uh, I don't think there'll be any deterioration in our relationship. As a matter of fact, if you might, you might have seen only this morning that the two prime ministers met accidentally at Delhi airport and they took advantage of that opportunity and talked for about 15 minutes. So our relationships, um, as I said, I, I don't think they deteriorate. But what about Kashmir? Of course, that's the, I believe you have quite a few disputes with India, but Kashmir is, uh, is the most pronounced, shall we say. That is Will it have any effect, will this uh, agreement with the United States have any effect on the Kashmir dispute? Do you think it's have a better chance of its uh, being settled? Well, <laughs> Mr. Hamilton, actually, uh, you are in a better position to answer that question because this dispute is, has been seized by the United Nations and uh, in the Security Council for the last six years, uh, this bis dispute has been argued uh, year after year. Uh, we are no nearer a solution today than we were when this dispute first came up in, uh, in the United Nations. Uh, as a matter of fact, both countries have agreed to have a free and, and impartial plebiscite. Admiral Nimitz was uh, chosen by both countries ad as the administrator, but he has been waiting the last three years to be put into position. So I, as far as that dispute is concerned, I think the position is um, that it will remain as it is for some time, till Mr. Nehru makes up his mind to have a free and impartial plebiscite. 
Mr. Ambassador, Moscow wasn't too pleased with those preliminary reports that you were going to ask for military aid from the United States. Now, how do you think this is going to affect your relations with the, your neighboring communist states? Well, I think our relationship mm, would be the same. They don't like this aid. <coughs> but beyond that, I, I doubt very much if the, uh, there'll be any worsening of uh, our relationship to what they are today. Mr. Ambassador, it was understood that this uh, grant in aid, in military aid, was awaiting a treaty of alliance between you and uh, Turkey, the other end of the Muslim Crescent. Now, what effect uh, will this have on your policies? Will you have joint policies now with Turkey? Well, as you know, the government of Turkey and the government of Pakistan have agreed uh, to collaborate together uh, in, the, in the field of politics, economics, and culture and uh, they are now negotiating a treaty which should bring in these two countries nearer. Uh, we in Pakistan have a very soft corner for the Turks uh, and we have a um, great deal of um, sentiment and great deal of affinities with that country. So I hope that this treaty which is being negotiated would bring the two countries nearer together. Uh, the hope is that uh, they'll, the other countries in that area would join in this collaboration so that we'll have Turkey, Iraq, Iran, and Pakistan. But of course the choice is entirely the choice of those countries. And uh, it's a voluntary collaboration. And if they come in, uh, it will be better for the peace of the world because this kind of uh, collaboration is, is purely defensive. It's uh, not uh, against anyone, uh, it's, it, it's not pointed against any one particular country or, or a number of countries. Actually, I thought, Mr. Ambassador, that the, our agreement with you and your agreement with the Turks seemed to indicate a shift in the grand strategy of the, of the free world. That is to say that we were, the free world was going to put its de defense, its, its first line of defense, certainly, against a communist attack in the northern tier of states, Turkey, Iran and Pakistan. Do you think that that's the, that strategy will work? Do you think that the first line can, can be held? Uh, yes, sir. If you have that alliance between the three states you mentioned, then, um, and if that alliance is strengthened, it, it could hold if there was aggression. But uh, at the present moment, uh, the, the collaboration which uh, will come into effect uh, very soon, I hope, is between Turkey and Pakistan. And as, uh, as I hope, the, if the other countries come in, that uh, certainly will add further strength. Iran, too. Yes, certainly. Mr. Ambassador, as a British Dominion, of course, uh, this will strengthen your relations, I presume, with the uh, British Commonwealth. But how will it affect uh, your relations with the rest of the uh, Arab states and its, uh, their relations and their uh, attitude towards uh, Israel, Suez Canal, and freedom of Tunisia and Morocco? Well, uh, in the, as Mr. Hamilton knows, in the United Nations we have been um, supporting the independence of uh, Tunisia and Morocco, and we continue to do, do that. As far as uh, the Suez Canal question is concerned, uh, the part we have tried to play is uh, to lend our good offices for a just and fair solution between uh, the government of Egypt and uh, the government in the United Kingdom. At one, one time we thought that uh, the both countries were getting very near and we hoped that uh, they'd be able to solve this question amicably. Um, in regard to the other Arab countries, we are very friendly with them and I hope that um, this uh, new uh, collaboration uh, would not in any way affect that friendliness which we have for the Arab countries. Certainly from our part, but there would be no, no change. Mr. Ambassador, last autumn uh, you were the President of the United Nations Economic and Social Council and you uh, lent some very useful efforts towards guiding the Council in its work towards helping the underdeveloped countries <coughs> of the world. But that was economic aid and what you are to get now from the United States is military aid. Do you feel these are Reconcilable? Well, yes, sir. I, I, I think they're reconcilable in this way that, um, see, uh, when um, at the independence of Pakistan, the main um, uh, reservoir of equipment 
was what is today India. And we were to get our due share from India uh, of our equipment. We got very little and the rest was held by India. So we had to make that deficiency by purchasing that equipment from the governments of the United Kingdom and the government of the United States. And we have been purchasing every year. Uh, even now, there is some equipment which is um, on its way to Pakistan. Now, all this equipment is bought from our foreign exchange earnings. And if we get economic uh, military aid, we will be able to divert some of that money to other... I see. Well, as a final question, may I ask you, what effect do you think this uh, new uh, uh, alliance, so to speak, with the United States will have on Pakistan and perhaps its attitude towards the United States? Sir? Well, uh, as you know, my country is, uh, is extremely friendly with the uh, United States. Uh, we received uh, 700,000 tons of wheat last year, which brought the two countries very much closer because this was a great act of generosity on the part of the people of the United States. So this friendliness, I think, will be strengthened further with this military aid going to Pakistan. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. <coughs> Privileged to have you here tonight. Thank you, sir. The opinions you've heard our speakers express tonight have been entirely their own. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Larry Lesseur and Thomas J. Hamilton. Our distinguished guest was Sayed Amjad Ali, ambassador from Pakistan to the United States. A Longines watch makes the most distinguished gift, for a Longines watch is not alone one of the very finest watches made anywhere in all the world, but equally important, the watch of highest prestige. Now consider these beautiful Longines watches for ladies. Here are superb examples of the jeweler's exquisite art. Diamonds where used are of the finest quality. Meticulous hand finishing gives that final touch of perfection. For men, Longines has created a watch for every need and purpose. Shockproof, moisture resistant automatic watches for rugged service. Handsome dress watches for business and formal wear. Each style with impressive good taste. And every Longines watch, whether for a lady or for a gentleman, is made to the unique Longines standards of excellence, which have won for Longines 10 World's Fair Grand Prizes, 28 gold medals, highest honors for accuracy in fields of precise timing. And yet, you may buy and own or proudly give a Longines watch for as little as 7150. So, see your authorized Longines Whitnor Jeweler Agency. And remember, that throughout the world, no other name on a watch means so much as Longines, the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored gift, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. This is Frank Knight, reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches.